everyone. Welcome to this new episode of Carolyn Talks. I'm your host, Carolyn Hines, film critic and journalist. And this is the podcast Slash Chips with Shadow. And today I'm very happy to be joined by filmmaker Ju Chun to talk about his film Unidentified, which I saw at the 2022 Toronto Real Asian International Film Festival. Kind of long. But um, I had a lot of fun with this film. And it was actually kind of surprised at the end in the Q&A when Ju said he was the writer and director of a film called The Time Agent. I have seen that film. And I didn't realize it was used until after I was in the audience. I was like, wait, I've seen that film. And I really liked it. Mm-hmm. So I'm glad to be actually able to talk to you about Unidentified. And I do have questions about the about the time agent as well. But as usual, before we get into the film, I'll just ask Jude to say a bit about himself and what got him into filmmaking. So Jude? Uh, hi. <laughs> um, so uh, my name is Jude. I'm a Korean Canadian filmmaker, and I'm currently working in Korea, Seoul, Korea. Um, I, unidentified, uh, we started making in like 2019, but um, everything was delayed because of COVID for a while, and then we finally finished this year. And um, so this is my first feature film, <laughs> um, and actually the the short film, the Time Agent, we made that in. Um, so that came out in 2016 and that also played at, uh, the Toronto, uh, real Asian festival. Um, so it was really fun to come back with my first feature after the, my, my short film, uh, screened here. Mm. And the thing with the time agent and on that, then I'm unidentified is that if I realized, cause I rewatched time agent this morning, just to refresh <laughs> my memory, cause I first saw that film. Um, so I, there's something I do every Saturday night with a friend of mine. We co-host something called Saturday Night Sci-Fi, which is a Twitter um, live tweet event where every quarter we have what we call um, sci-fi short series. So we curate a list of sci-fi shorts from around the world. And we just like spend the night, um, usually from 10 o'clock um, to like 12, watching like short films from around the world. And there was one, one event where we did short films from Asia. And this was probably, I think, in around 2018. And your film, The Time Agent, was one of the films that we <laughs> did for that. And so I noticed in both The Time Agent and um, Unidentified, you 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 play a lot with um, so a style called vignettes. So this is where you show like small moments from people's lives. So I wanted to ask you about your philosophy as a filmmaker and how like what inspired you to becoming a filmmaker and like what inspires your style choice for being a filmmaker? Uh, hmm. I think, well, in terms of wanting to be a filmmaker, I've I kind of wanted to since I was like in um, high school or so, but uh, I did, didn't really have many, um, much education around me growing up about film or the arts. So it uh, wasn't much later. I, I didn't get into the film program I wanted to. So I just kind of did, uh, so I ended up with like a psychology major, but I just... <laughs> kind of went into the syllabuses of all the film students and w- what are they reading? I looked at all the books that they're supposed to read, all the movies they're supposed to watch. And I just, um, I guess taught myself like that. Um, and yeah, and then just started working in the industry and I guess, uh, kind of learned like that, like, um, mostly in Korea, it was actually that, um, so I grew up in, uh, like, the U.S. and also mostly Toronto, mm-hmm. um, but after graduating, I kind of had a, an opportunity to work like small jobs in Korea, so I just went, and I wasn't planning on staying this long, but I've been in Korea for 13 years now, and um, just met like a bunch of people that I uh, work well with, and we make like films and music videos and like dance films and a uh, bunch of stuff like that. So um, yeah, that's the kind of group we made um, both the time agent and um, uh, unidentified with. Yeah. Mm. And you you mentioned that you started out with psychology and uh, you, you're both of those, you're, I noticed both films, it kind of ties into the whole vignettes where like your film kind of like talks about the human psyche and how we relate to each other. And from, I would say almost like from uh, an, 
um, an analytical perspective. And it's not very obvious, but if you pay attention to how you tell the stories and the dialogue that the characters have, a lot of the dialogue, especially in um, Unidentified, is they're asking each other's questions to get to know more about each other. So do you think that your psychology background at has actually played a, a pretty significant part in your um, work as a filmmaker and how you craft the stories? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I think so. I guess... Um it wasn't time wasted in the end <laughs> um I learned a lot about like yeah and I guess that kind of stuff has always interested me so um yeah when I'm writing characters and stuff I think that is like uh psychoanalytic like just kind of like an approach where kind of like people do things but they're, they're not always aware of why they're doing things or they'll think they're doing things for one reason but they're actually doing it because of more deep seated psych like psychological reasons and stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of, I guess, uh, my view of how humans <laughs> work and I guess uh, like characters in, in my movies also work. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So, and this is where we will start talking about an identify because this film, I think is going to surprise people who watch it because just from reading the synopsis, you can't really get a, like a clear understanding of what this film is until you actually start watching it. So um, Unidentified is a film of, that is begins in 1993, where these massive orbs from outer space, these interstellar orbs, uh, start to appear over major cities in the world, and they just hang there. They don't open up. Aliens don't come out that we know of anyway, that have, that have not been detected. And they, they're just hanging there from 1993 until present is so the film is set which i thought was interesting that the film once it time skips is set in 2022 so first we got i gotta start talking we gotta start with this film's being beginning in 1993 so i know a little bit about korean history and some of the politics i thought it was and I, and I needed to make sure that i was thinking correctly because um of of, of a reference that you made later on in the film and we'll get to that but I went back and I did some research. I remember 1993 is where it was the first democratic election in South Korea, where the first civilian um, president was elected. So I wanted to ask if that was your purpose for selecting of all years, the year that this is when um, South Korea really truly became democratic and like the students mm -hmm. after like decades of fighting got their wish for a, a true democracy. Yeah, um, it was part of it, but not so much because... Because it, it was the, the democratic um, systems were in place, but because it was so turbulent in mm -hmm. before that, um, I, I, I basically I wanted it in present day and I wanted the characters to be like kind of similar, closer, <laughs> like to my age. Like, um, so I was initially thinking like mid thirties characters. So that would have to mean that UFOs have uh, came because I wanted the UFOs have to been on earth longer than the age of the characters mm. so like like so that the ufos have been there ever since they were born so it's like a part of normal life to them but then if i put the ufos in the 80s it was a very turbulent time politically in K korea so it would complicate things too much like um but in the 90s it was more relatively kind of how do you say um settled even though of course there were a lot, a lot of things always going on but um, a lot less than like the 70s or the 80s so that's kind of why I chose um, around the 90s yeah <laughs> yeah no that that makes sense to me and it's kind of interesting also that you pick that that era too because the 90s were when we really started to get a, like a lot of UFO films like you know films like mm -hmm. Independence uh -huh. Day and then the oh, yeah. shows yeah, like yeah. the X-Files and a lot of these um, Canadian shows one of them was about Nostradamus I never remember the name of the show but it was about Nostradamus and you had we had like a lot of and then you got like Star Trek um this Star Trek f series Next Generation all of these so like that was like a per also perfect way to have a film set in the 90s where like sci-fi is really beginning to pick up and the world is changing because we had the world wide web like you and me we grew up I was born before the internet was a thing <laughs> right and like we grow and like yeah, yeah. The, the, the the orb to me it it represents to me it can represent a lot of things a lot of things that mean significant change in the world yeah. today and uh, for of course like you were saying in the Q&A after the film that a lot of it has to do with the pandemic and how the pandemic 
changed um, us. And even while I was watching the film, that thought occurred to me. I was like, the orb is like COVID. You know, it's this thing at, at the beginning in 2020 where, where it, like, it just suddenly appeared and it just created this global ripple effect all around the world. And we, I don't even like to say that we become normal because I think too many of us have become complacent, but it is becoming normalized and a, a normal part of our day to day lives. And that's because we haven't really done enough to like stem the tide of this. But for kids who were born within the last mm-hmm. two and a half, three years, this is something, this is going to be their arm. This is going to be their UFO. So can you talk a bit about um, having the film crafted this way where it could represent COVID, but it can also just be a symbol of like a great change and something that we just as human beings grow to accept? Yeah, yeah. Like um, we... <laughs> We uh, we started shooting in 2019, so like before COVID. So like I wrote this in like 2018, so we had no idea <laughs> this would happen. But then we had kind of always intended to shoot uh, mo- the movie in segments because I wanted like different seasons. So like uh, winter of 2019, we were shooting the s- winter segments, and we thought you know next summer everything will be fine. We'll just shoot the summer segments. But of course, uh, everything got delayed a lot. But um. But yeah, when we got together, like in Korea, there were kind of like ups and downs of like safer times and like lockdown times. So we, when we got back together to shoot like the, the other segments, we were, we were kind of saying, this is like, this movie is kind of like a COVID metaphor. Of course, we didn't know when we were, uh, when I was writing or when we were planning it. But yeah, it, it kind of was this sense. But even when I was writing in 2018 before COVID, um, the kind of the world felt a bit like that. Like there's a sense of looming uncertainty. Um, not like just one political figure or something like that, but like politically, like just like ideologically, it, it, it felt like this long uncertain, not like a sudden kind of thing, like, like world war two or like, like um, one like the Korean War in Korea, like one big conflict where it is obviously very tragic, like very high stakes conflicts, but the kind of conflict is pretty clear. You, you're you going to fight, you might win, you might lose, mm. and it's scary, but at least it's concrete. But I felt like for our generation, young generation, I guess even younger than my generation, it felt like the problems of the world were, were hard to even define. It's, it felt like um, like people can't trust each other because there's like so many different um, ideas going around that it's like not even speaking the same language. And it felt very yeah ambiguous. And then COVID was another one of those conflicts for this generation that's like a long-term thing. It's not like uh, you fight it and then we're done with it kind of thing, but it's like, yeah. Yeah, no, I totally relate to that. And like hearing you talk about how... Um, in 2018 and 2019 felt kind of ambiguous. This is something that I've talked to my, me and my friends have talked about a lot, where we said 2018 felt like it lasted a year and a half. And 2019 was this kind of surreal year where it felt like it was lasting like two and a half, three years. It, the year felt extremely long. And I, and it was kind of funny too, in the film where you have the characters talking about dreams. Like I, I, I get like what my mom, I get dreams that what my mom calls premonitions. And in 2019, I was getting a lot of these strange dreams where I was just getting this sense of like impending doom, like something is going to happen. And I had had surgery that year. And I remember I was planning, I was actually planning to go to um, South Korea because I wanted to, I really, really want to go to um, the Busan Film Festival. And I remember just before, and, and I had my surgery in August and I remember I had been planning to go and my surgeon was like, you can't travel because it's because I, I have like a metal plate in my head. I had a uh, tumor removed and my doctor was like, you can't travel because the air pressure is going to cause problems. But I remember before that, even just before I had my surgery, I remember I had this, this dream of like, no one is going to be able to travel for a really long time. And I couldn't, I couldn't pinpoint why. And I had had that, I've been having that dream for months and I had gone to the Sundance F- Festival in February of 2020. And I remember as soon as I got home, the dream that I had that night was air travel was going to stop for years. And I didn't know. So when in your film, when you have the characters talking about the, the dreams of like this other world, and some of the dreams were pretty clear, and some of the dreams were on it, um, like undefined, like they couldn't 
figure out what the dreams were. I just, I really related to that. And then especially you saying, you you just have talking about how when you were writing the film, like it was, it was kind of based on this ambiguous time. So I want you to talk about um, just the, the use of dreams in your mm-hmm. film, because I thought that was really interesting. And honestly, that's something we don't really see in films <laughs> these days. You don't really see people talk, unless it's a horror you know, where people are having like dreams of like demonic possession, or whatever, like you don't really get people talking about dreams and the interpretation of dreams and and the emotionality of dreams, because dreams can have um, an emotional impact on you as well as like psychologically. Yeah, I think um, I think some like screenwriting book or some coach said like, you know, you never put dreams in movies because it's you can't related to people like it's such unless you, like so you recreate like visually like you do shoot a scene that's supposed to be the dream or something like that but like the most boring thing is someone talking about their dream because it's so personal it's only something even like in real life like you tell your friend about this awesome dream you had and as you're telling the story you realize it's not as exciting <laughs> as when you have it like in your head as when you're telling it because it's such a personal it's like a feeling you remember more than Uh, actual like plot events or something when you lay out the plot events of your dream it's like that's not a very good story but then you it feels so real to you right Mm -hmm. when you wake up right so so I guess I was thinking of like dreams or something like that where like it can be like completely like 100 200 percent real to you but you can't really prove it to anybody else Mm -hmm. like um and I guess, like, I was thinking of the reason the film is called Unidentified. I'm um, also like, you know, the unidentified flying object, but also just, I guess it's a play on words of like identity. All the characters are struggling with their identity. And in the film, it's kind of abstract in some way. Am I an alien and all these different alien identities? But um, but in life, I guess, um, identity is kind of a key word for a lot of people. And like, it for... That's like something you know about yourself, but you can't really prove to other people. It's like, but you believe, and no one can, (laughs) no matter what anyone says, if you feel that's your identity, that's your identity, right? So, um, yeah, I wanted to, I guess, explore that. The personality, uh, the personalness, the uh, innerness, I guess. How do you say it? <laughs> it's just like only, something only you can really like um, know, but you know it for so sh- you know it's so sh- for like so concretely and so sh- like ah, like you're so sure about it, like your dream, like what you dream. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I understand because like if I like I I if I would tell someone say okay, I just I have this dream about mm. something bad coming, and they're like, <laughs> explain it to me. You're like, I can't. Ex- explain it but I just yeah, feel yeah, it and you just know yeah, yeah. yeah so I get it because like that is something like we like we can explain things to people and like even for films like a film is like the the visual manifestation of like for instance an idea and a dream you had but until you actually st- but when, even when you're piecing the film together like you still have to try to explain things to people mm-hmm. and they might not necessarily get it like the vision you're like i have a vision of this film which is yeah, a, a yeah. giant arm and you have to explain it to like to to the to like the vfx artists who who created yeah, the art yeah, you have yeah. to explain this thing that only exists within your mind to this other person and they have to be able to they'll they'll draw it but you have to keep correcting them till it's exactly yeah, what you want yeah. yeah exactly i think um um, I had told everybody that it's going to be a giant sphere with like no like features or mm-hmm. it's not the typical like a, like a like a spaceship design. It's not like an organic design. It's going to be like a nothingness. And that's that's the point. Like there are no features. There's no clues as what it is. Um, I, I mean, <laughs> I told this to me, but then they kind of assumed there would be something. So like when I showed them, it's like, it's like really nothing there's like it is just the norm yeah yeah it's yeah yeah so they were kind of even though like i explained it like um there were kind of even like with the vfx art when they were like oh so you know it's not really nothing right like what they wanted to put in like these like details and stuff and it's like no 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 no. it really has to be nothing but um yeah no i i understand that because i hear you talk it it, like it's a void because if Mm. we're using it as a metaphor is um like in time space that like we call black holes are just a, a void of nothingness. 
You know, mm-hmm. that's what a black hole is. And in the sky, these orbs are just like a giant hole of nothingness. And that's where like the sense of doom could be an absence of this, just like of anything positive coming. So like you have, you have to say, okay, I don't feel anything positive coming. So it has to be um, something that's um, a, a sense of doom or even, um, even for the film, like some of the characters in their dreams, some of them have really dreams of like, happy moments like one of the per- one of the characters his he has a dream of music and he's like this is possibly the nat- national anthem of the country in space where i'm from or like there's this lady where she's drawing the sunset on a beach and that's that brings her peace but then there's another character we're going to talk about these two characters Romeo and juliet where like mm-hmm. she believed juliet she believes this um this dream of this person she can't identify what this person is like she says i can't describe his air i can't describe his eyes but i know what he is i know what he looks like and this and for her it's just like this person doesn't exist but she knows that he does exist you know so the the, the orb is kind of like that like what you're talking about describing things to people like it's kind of like you're like i have a sense that this person is this but i can't tell you what they look like yeah yeah um so for the Romeo and Juliet couple, I think, yeah. So that's kind of, that's her belief about who she is, I think. Mm-hmm. Like, m- m- even more so than, like, this other person that she's looking for. Like, she believes I am this one half of this um, relationship. And I was promised in her dream that, you know, we're going to meet again <laughs> on Earth. Like, and um, And, like, in our world, like, I guess someone has, like, Go, might go to a, psych, a psychologist and they might say you know you know you watch too many disney movies <laughs> you have this fantasy about this prince on a you know yeah. uh white horse uh, and you know that's unhealthy but then in this world like it's this alien kind of she believed that's who she is like she is mm-hmm. an alien and this is part of who she believes she is so um i get so later i guess when things don't work out as she thought then it's not just a sense of oh it's a breakup like you know it's that it's it's a sense of like may am i not who i thought i am mm. like it's to do with her identity so i think that's kind of yeah the weight yeah. of it yeah no that's um that's kind of interesting because i thought her, her character i'll be honest at first i didn't recognize the, <laughs> the actress because her <laughs> hair was purple and i was like mm. i was doubting myself at the beginning i was like is this film having a time jump i'm like are we skipping time and i couldn't figure out if it was two parallel universes existing at the same time uh-huh. i'm like is this the same person is this her twin sister so mm. i thought it was interesting because she has purple hair when they meet and then when they mm. when they break up her hair is long and it's like green and I, I was confused. And I, mm-hmm. But I was confused in a good way because it made me really think about the, the timeline of the film. Because I, uh, I was like, what is happening? Is this really art? Like, is what we see really reality? You uh-huh. know? So that was interesting for me. And so for like the characters, so that's Romeo and Juliet. Uh, Romeo was first because this is their scene meeting on the bus. And I, I had the thought, if this is a Romeo, there has to be a Juliet. Mm-hmm. And I was like, if there's a Juliet, that means this story is not uh-huh. going to end well. <laughs> you know, because Ro- the story of <laughs> Romeo and Juliet never ends well. Um, so I, I, I want this is, and it's, it's not even a romantic relationship because we don't get to see them being together romantically. So I want you to talk about the different relationships in this film because there's Romeo and Juliet. And they're the only ones who technically are given names as characters, and then there's the three characters at the beginning, uh, which is the, in the first chapter is titled um, Three Ray Conversation." And they're having this in there. So like there's that relationship. And then there's the relationship between the brother and the sister. But this is when we realize, okay, so these aliens really do exist um, on Earth. And so like there's different types of relationships. So talk about um, creating the relationships and how you wanted the plot to follow each of these relationships. Uh, yeah. Um, so one of the things... Uh, in, in the script writing process, like way before, like um, I was thinking, how are yeah these people gonna be related? Is it gonna be like a uh, like a magnolia kind of thing, like Paul Thomas says, like where there's like these connections? Like at first, it doesn't seem like they're connected, but there's like all these things that add up. But um, in the end, like I think there are some places where they kind of run into each other or, or are in the same place but it's not very important that they, there's no like significant relationship and i kind of felt like that goes better with 
the feel of the movie where everyone is disconnected like that three-way conversation scene and like a few of the scenes i'm kind of i think i'm kind of really going into how disconnected people mm -hmm. are it's hard to connect and that's kind of the point of uh the film and the theme of like this ufo and, and people having to there's the whole theme of the alien mind control syndrome where people there's like rumors going around that like invasion of the body snatcher some people look like humans but they're actually aliens but there's no proof of that so everyone's just kind of suspicious but it's also kind of a crazy thing to say that i think you're an alien <laughs> or like that and then there's the people who actually think that they are an alien who can't really say that because there is that whole invasion of the body snatchers rumor going around. So, and there's like rumors of like people are assaulting people on the streets because they think they're aliens or the other way around where aliens are assaulting people. There's like all these rumors and confusion going around. And, and kind of like, that's like, as I was, I think I was right. Um, writing in 2018, the confusion of the, about the world, the world being seeming so di divided, like, mm -hmm. Different than before, different than like, I don't know, like Cold War dynamics <laughs> where even like, like like the teams, the teams were kind of clear, like in the Cold War or like, but then now it felt more like um, it, unclear even like um, what the teams are, if there are teams and it's just like, what are people thinking? It's like, it felt like uh, maybe I'm an alien or maybe this person's an alien in the way we think and we can't relate to other people. So, um, oh, I think I like went way off the question. Um, no, 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 you're getting was, it. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, in terms of the relationships, oh, oh, but I think one thing I do, I did also want to portray is people really do want to connect. Mm. really want to connect but find it really hard to connect <laughs> and i guess the romeo and julia is one example of that the three-way conversation is like they're trying to uh these people i guess online or like anonymously trying to find other aliens so yeah. they try to meet but they have to do it in secret because there's like these rumors and like you know like people might attack them so they're like wanting to connect but also suspicious of each other and even when they do finally connect the two guys by the river they realize oh finally like we've confirmed uh that oh we're both like alien identity people oh finally you know but then they have completely different ideas about what being an alien means so it's like oh even then it's hard to connect and mm -hmm. yeah just kind of thematically the kind of like difficulty of connecting yeah, the conversation between two of them in particular is funny. And like this is a completely random aside, but when he described what a character is like as being like a, a pumpkin and a cucumber, I was like, you know what? That makes perfect sense. <laughs> I had never thought of like, what, what would I describe what a character is? But I was like, that's exactly what it was. Oh, <laughs> I thought I was yeah, like, kind of, yeah. Funny. <laughs> I was trying to think like, uh, maybe that's how an alien would describe <laughs> like Earth, Earth things <laughs> yeah yeah it was like that's so right was, i just it was completely random but i was like yes that's exactly how i would describe it but the thing <laughs> but the other thing where their conversations is like as we were saying it's kind of as it's so i don't know if it's providence or like serendipitous or coincidence that like you said you started writing this film in 2018 and your ideas and the purposes for the way how these conversations are structured was completely different and the context of them changes completely in the different um the context of them changes completely, you know, because of the times that we're in, as we were saying, like, you didn't start it with this film being a metaphor, technically, for, for living in what we call these COVID times. But now, in 2022, that's exactly what it is. It, like, it kind of stands in as a metaphor for that. And the way how you were, and the way how the conversations uh, were, because these are people, as you were saying, they don't know, they can't really fully trust each other because they don't know who they can trust because it's pretty, they're like, if I identify as an alien, will this person attack me? Because I'm an because I said I'm an alien, or will they accept me because they themselves also think um, think they're an alien? But it kind of like made me think of how after we came out of lockdown, like even now, like we've been out of lockdown here in Toronto, technically almost a year now. And even when we meet people, like we still don't know how to interact with people. You're like, do I hug you? Do I <laughs> do I stand away from you? Do I shake your hand? We are still yeah. awkward. We still don't know how to communicate with with each other. You know, we're still like. 
like you still like when you go on the train and I hear someone I because I'm immunocompromised I still wear my mask when I go out so when I hear people cough with cough I'm like is it a COVID cough is it just like a regular cough is it a winter cough you know like you still have all of these thoughts and we still don't know how to we've lost our ability to I think instantaneously read situations we're learning how to acclimate and how to adapt to this new world so I just like I just think like when you were when you were finished with the film, like all the editing and everything that's done and you watched it for the first time after it was completed. What were your thoughts about how the film has now become a metaphor <laughs> technically for, for COVID? Yeah, I know that was something like we were thinking. And there's like even in the first scene, there's like like coughing, kind of like you right? can catch a, like these lines. I hadn't we shot we shot that like way before and we had no idea. COVID would happen but like those kind of things just kind of um it was, it was I, I guess it wasn't like um that huge of a deal I guess it was if it was like we thought it was like that huge of a deal we might have changed it like in the middle when we were shooting but it felt like a part of the whole thing like the kind of the whole sense of the world like I think maybe if just this virus portion of COVID like just if the COVID virus this pandemic happened in I don't know um like 1993, for example, um, I think maybe people would have dealt with it differently. I'm not mm -hmm. sure. I don't know. But especially in like North America, it became a very politicized <laughs> pandemic, right? Yeah. Like where it's not just about, okay, this is the health guy. Okay, this is you follow the doctor's rules, right? Like maybe it might have been like that if it happened in the 90s. Who knows? But I think like like the climate of like the, where the world is plus the pandemic kind of exasperated all the things that were happening and are like suspicion of other people and like oh it, you're a mask wearer therefore you're on this team some team and you're a mask you don't wear a mask so it's like everything became like making teams of or like you know sides for stuff so i think like that's a part of it and that is a part of i think the theme even before COVID, so I felt like it amplified it, but it's kind of in within the same um, uh, theme. So, yeah. Yeah. So another thing about the teams, like there, um, the concept of teams or just finding um, groups or enclaves is mm -hmm. there is one that would, that people would describe as a cult. And mm -hmm. this is the, and this is where one of the, the main characters, um, what, does he, does he have a name as a character? Because I don't think he, he's not named. Yeah, I, actually, none of the characters have names, technically, even like Romeo and Juliet, that's not yeah. like their name. Nobody says anybody's name throughout the yeah. whole film. So in the end, when I have the when the credits go up, uh, their, their names are just the actors' names for all mm -hmm. the characters. But throughout the movie, nobody really has a right. name that's vocalized ever. Right. Okay. So there's this character um, that he, he walks around with a sign saying the aliens aren't real. He's like denying that aliens are real uh -huh. while there's a giant floating arm oh, hanging yeah. above the city of Seoul. And he, he's this character. Um, I had asked you about this in the Q&A where he starts out stuttering and he's being interviewed by the mm -hmm. filmmaker, which would be you. But the film is set in a documentary, a mockumentary style. And he's being interviewed by the person. And he's... Um, He's saying, oh, everyone is crazy because they don't, they're not believing what I'm saying, which is that aliens aren't real. And he's like, he's, and you're, you're wondering, does he really believe what he's saying? Like, is he so like blinded by his own, um, his own denial? Like he legit refuses to acknowledge the existence of this mm -hmm. giant thing. But then um, um, another, the, the, after, what I thought was so interesting about this character is that he was so nice and, um, and, 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 and I think thoughtful because he's he's making he starts to make ramen and like the the videographer is asking him, Oh, who are you making ramen for? He's like, for both of us. He said, But why? He's like, But you're here. So, like, why wouldn't I share with you? And I thought it was such a sweet moment in the film where he's just like, so he's like, normally I would have a half pack, but because that's enough to film. But he's like, I'm gonna make this whole thing and I'm gonna share it with you. So I thought it was such a sweet moment. And it says so much about his character. And it um it, it's kind of like along the line of don't judge a book by its cover, you know, like that that whole kind of situation. So talk a bit about him because I think he was one of the more fascinating characters in the and like we end up learning that he knows sign language and that his sister uses sign language, she uses sign language to communicate. We're not sure if she's um mute or if she's deaf, but that's how they communicate. Mm -hmm. So talk a bit about him uh, first, and then about their relationship and then their cult that they belong to. Oh yeah, 
Um, yeah, so with his character, so uh, his sign says that uh, UFOs don't exist, which is mm. similar to aliens, but also just the f- aliens. There might be aliens inside. That's still kind of a question, but UFOs, the, well, the, those big objects definitely do, like, to the people in the world, it's obvious. But yeah. him saying that is, I guess, kind of like, um, you know, in our world, I guess, if somebody's going around talking about like UFOs, like in the streets, we might consider, oh, that's a crazy person. But in this world, it's the opposite. Like someone who's saying they don't exist is the kind of perceived as the crazy person. So, um, so yeah, I talked <laughs> with about uh, this with the actor a lot. And he's like, do I really not see them? Am I like, do I, <laughs> are they like, what, what's, do I really believe what I'm saying? And it's, um, and I think on the level, like it, he's not like crazy as in like he, doesn't see them like physically with his eyes but i think more so his point is that um in the end of the conversation uh the interview that he's having after having i mean he's he kind of asks them like do uh do you know why they're here like do you know where they're from and do you know what they want and nobody in the world does and the interviewer says that (laughs) then then for him, it's like the same thing as he's just saying, it's like, then that means they don't exist. It's like the same thing as them not existing. Um, I guess he's, uh, I I don't know if there's like a word for this philosophy or anything Mm -hmm. like this, but it's kind of this um, sense of like, you know, the physical, like we are very materialist and like modern people, like we like physical, like, existence is the meaning of existence but like in olden times it was uh before like science and everything it was more metaphysical like uh, the existences of things weren't so much based on the materiality but like on ideas or like emotions and stuff like that so um i guess he's just kind of like and his philosophy is all jumbled up and it's not meant to be like something i think like you're like um supposed to like understand oh he's got a point but it's more kind of like oh it's like different yeah we think about the world in different ways like this material way is one way and i mean that's how i think of the world like if i saw this ufo and you know helicopters go up and we can knock on it and like we do all these science experiments it is there like that means it is there but then to uh maybe in different eras or like different um mindsets it, existence is like a different thing and <laughs> maybe it's too yeah <clears throat> but uh that was kind of just the thing and his in terms of like his language he stutters a lot when we um uh, me first meet him and i think like for me like him being so nice to the documentarian is like just knowing how lonely he is he's like <laughs> he's like very he just wants to sh- because like he's alone nobody agrees with him like nobody thinks everybody thinks he's crazy so like um um i think that's and that's kind of the reason he goes back to his um uh the cult that he grew up in but that he left um yeah and that's where his sister is who uh speaks in sign language and and so he knows that and later on when he speaks he doesn't have to stutter and i think it's just his sense of um the stutter is kind of like a bit of exaggerated manifestation of like his his sense of um being lonely and like un like unmoored and like uh whereas when he goes back to his gold even maybe it's not what he it, they don't go with what he believes but still they're together and there's like these people who accept him and that's like kind of gives him peace even if it's not um, intellectually what he believes or philosophically agrees he'd rather he has to choose between is he going to be the lone like um the center or is he just going to go with the crowd and just kind of find a family mm. yeah no i i i personally can kind of relate to that i'm um, like having grown up in church like almost my entire mm. life and then just like being within the last few years just kind of like pulling away so like i understand because like you can be you can have a philosophy or an idea that isolates you from everyone and it doesn't even have to be a philosophy of the idea it could be like uh like for some people if they're disabled like they feel isolated from other people who are able-bodied but don't know or don't know how to relate to them or treat them like you know just like a regular person so like that's isolating and then I thought it was interesting so this scene this this is the scene that I or sequence in the film that I think 
is I think it speaks it it has so much that it says contextually. So for this scene, like he first of first he I looked at it as him being baptized again. He's getting rebaptized because his sister rings the bell and the rain or the water starts falling from the orb. And this is where we get a close-up shot of the orb and the surface of it looks like um some mm-hmm. people would say it's a brain or mm-hmm. like the human brain, or it could look like to me, it kind of made me think of coral, you know, like mm-hmm. coral from yeah. the coral reefs. Yeah. Like there's this mm-hmm. coral, there's, there's this coral reef with them, the the it's called brain coral and it kind of made me think mm, yeah 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 so we I wanted to ask you about that, that yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah we yeah that's actually the references i showed the vfx people to model in on yeah um of course like on the scale like it's the size of like water drops so like mm-hmm. you would have to be like really close to see those patterns but um uh yeah I, uh i'm not sure why exactly i picked that texture but it felt like a good texture for like water to kind of like mm-hmm. water drops to like flow through and um and kind of maze like so adds to that sense of like kind of mystery but yeah <laughs> yeah, no, yeah i thought it was interesting because like he gets so he gets baptized in the water <laughs> um mm-hmm. and then that's like him just that like, you're saying like he may not philosophically still believe in what they're saying but he needs that community so he does what he needs to be to accept it and then it starts to break out into dance. They start dancing. And this is the second scene in the film where dancing just happens. It's like spontaneous dancing. For me, the first scene with the dancing is you had said it was by the choreographer. And his dancing is just like, is he's finished with working that day. And it's like, he does his way of breaking away from the mundanity of being in an office for like 10, 12 hours. <laughs> and dancing is his way of just expressing that he's, this is where he's truly free, just dancing on the street. And then this scene with the dancing, um, with the um, with the cult on the roof, to me, that scene, that one, I'll be honest with you, I couldn't completely watch that scene with my eyes. I had to close my eyes because of the sound, because hearing the sound and then seeing the frenetic dancing, it felt like a lot like um, sensory overload, you mm-hmm. know? And because it's building and it's building, building. and it's building yeah, and it's yeah, building. Yeah. And my brain just started to feel run. I was like, okay, I have to make a choice. Either I block my ears up and watch mm-hmm. or I close my eyes up and I listen. So I had to close my eyes was easier. So I wanted to ask you about just building this this tension and this release. And it felt like this whole, it was felt like a release for the characters, but also release for the audience because like once it's up, you're just like, <sighs> and it's just like this whole release. And it's like this release of everything that happened and again using the COVID metaphor it this uh, this was another scene that made me think of like after we came out of lockdown people were just like we're like oh my god we can finally go back outside and it was like people like we were had been indoors for like two years and like everyone just wanted to be back to normal and it was just like, this massive culture release of energy mm-hmm. and like frustration and anger and that scene conveys all of these things. So talk about that scene and working with the choreographer and the team and just the and the musicians too, because the composition, like it is a lot. It's a it's a lot because there's a there's vocalization for the singing <laughs> and then the art. It's just like so much um audibly yeah, yeah. and visually. So talk about that. Yeah, yeah. Um uh like the music and the dance, I think you will kind of feel like it's um it's very tribal. Like mm-hmm. there's like a tribal energy to it. Like it's very, um, and I was kind of going for that feel of like, I think in the past before like modern society, there were a lot of rituals uh, back from like, you know, like real, like tribal societies, like dances and stuff like that to like um, uh, medieval religions and stuff. They have like these rituals where there's like a set a sequence you follow with other people and you all know the sequence and you go through it. And it's kind of like, I don't know, I guess anthropologists would describe it as like a communal um, kind of release, a catharsis, like this feeling of like, kind of like, uh, like letting the stress of, I don't know, everything kind of just kind of come out releasing, like, because otherwise, like in as individuals, like uh, you know, like people who have like lived in isolation, like in that sense of like, like if you haven't talked to anyone for like weeks, as a, a sense of like you have to like ah just let it out, like in the mountains, just like, ah like just screaming, and maybe after COVID, like people just want ah just like haven't had a conversation with anyone, so, ah just like this build up and just letting out, and I think uh uh. Kind of, I think that's kind of like a function of like um, 
rituals and like tribal kind of um, uh, rituals, like things that you do together as a community. Um, and I kind of wanted to give this UFO religion that function in this society. Like these people, you know, they have all these, uh, all the dancers kind of like, they had like sequences, like there are kind of like dance solos and duets. And then there's like the big um, group dance at the end. But for each of them, I wanted, um, I guess it's, it's like modern da interpretive dance. So it's like, I don't know if how clearly it's uh, uh, conveyed to like non uh, guess dancers, but then it's that they kind of each had a story of like, Oh, one has like, Oh, I have work. Like, you know, I want to, you know, get promoted and make more money and stuff. But then there's this other guy who's like sucking up to the boss and like, oh, and, and then he's cut. So he made his dance a lot about like this verticality and striving and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And they all had like different stories um, that their characters are bringing from their out non-religious life into this religion. So they're kind of bringing it, have all this stress from their lives. They're bringing it to this rooftop and they're like expressing it and it's just like throwing it on and, all the other dancers are supporting them and feeling it together with them and just building it up, building up all this tension. And then there's just able to like, boom, just throw it. And like, in, the, in this like com combative, like kind of like very like, uh, the actions are very almost like warlike and like they're fighting and this, yeah, just kind of release it in this big kind of like uh, explosion mm. um, so that they can go back to their lives and maybe have a, less of a burden mm -hmm. and yeah that's an interesting way to think of it yeah because it's like this is their this is where they can release and that everything goes to that they they the tension that then builds back up when they're working again because one like the dancers <laughs> like because the thing is like a lot of the characters that we see throughout the film end up on this rooftop so they're the mm -hmm. same ones that are questioning like am i an alien or not but this is where they find their their community and like even the same, like the choreographer who's the actor in um, I think that was the third vignette, he's the choreographer. And like mm -hmm. he's this is where he as a dancer can be with other dancers. And then he goes back to work the next day <laughs> to be stuck oh, and yeah. be back in the office again. And then this is when they come back together again. This is his moment release again. So it's like a cycle. He's actually not in the scene. Uh, I think you well, saw him in the, in the yeah, he, he, you probably saw him in the behind the scenes part where he's he's yeah. he's uh, 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 directing the dancers, but then this is like this kind of behind the scenes thing. He, mm -hmm. uh, his character is not ac actually oh, not, he's in not the there. scene, oh, okay. but okay. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's like the two but the choreographer, like, yeah, yeah. It's like the two alien guys are thinking yeah. Oh. The guy who gets um like, baptized, I guess, with the, the the paint kind of thing. Um, he's the guy who was in the uh by the river who who had this very uh like uh survival of the fittest view of the world yeah. and, and then um he and then late right after the dancing he has an interview where he talks about his dream and his dream uh, is as like a farmer um and he, he just yeah uh i guess for him like for that character it's like he he's kind of like the kind of a darker character i guess the the dark side of mm -hmm. like the ufo identity where and i kind of i uh, i don't know if it's like a one-to-one -one thing but kind of like how in it's similar to it, it's similar in korea as in like the u.s and canada of how kind of the rural areas are more conservative and um, like the cities are more kind of like progressive and i think for i don't want to like define them as one block but then like for this character i wanted him to be like yeah he, he has do those are the memories he has of this more communal world where you're more in I guess in touch with nature and like it's more of a vill the village kind of like people know each other and then you have like these Thanksgiving kind of things where you harvest and you come together and whereas like the city it's like the city mouse and the country mouse kind of feeling where like oh those those like city people are so individualistic and like have their fancy educations and like look at the world in this different way and our country way of life it seems like the cities are getting bigger and our ways of life are aren't respected like mm -hmm. we're seen as stupid and like it's getting smaller and smaller and and that's kind of where his grievance comes from maybe this character is actually from the countryside in korea and that's kind of why he has this dream about being in the countryside as like his real identity while he's living in the city um these are kind of like possibilities i talked about with the actor but that i don't 
kind of want to like define it exactly because kind of the uncertainty is part of the thing but mm -hmm. then yeah that that emotion of being like i'm losing we're losing our traditional identities kind of mm. no i i get that like you don't want to define them because it kind of leaves it up to the audience um that's the fun of mm. it um these yeah, kind of films yeah. that we have is like we as an audience like each person can take something different from the mm -hmm. film and interpret something different with all of the characters that you could mean something different. And um, so like, we're gonna, I'll, we'll begin to wrap up now, but um, one of the things I do want, I do really, really want you to talk about is the, um, how you introduce um, the reunification of self and North Korea in the film. And you do it very subtly. You do it, it's, like, <laughs> it's just this thing that it has happened. And it's like a 20 year reunification too, because it's a 20 years, a 20 year celebration. So I want you to talk about um, introducing that into the film and like how anyone or if there were any like particular reactions to people who saw the film, especially in Korea, when you have that into the film, because that is something that a lot of Koreans, especially I think, um, Koreans from uh, older generations, they still want, you know, like reunification. And this is something, and like, for, especially for, I think, North American audiences, I mean, imagine the reaction is going to be different. So people, because a lot of people outside of, who don't know much about Korean history or culture, they don't really understand, they know North and South Korea with regards to how the North American media discusses them, but they don't understand, like, for many so many Koreans, they want a reunification together because the, I, the country has been split into for so long. They're just like, I want to be able to travel to the North American country and they want to find and see if I have any of my family members that were there during the separation, if, if anyone is still alive. So talk about introducing it into film and any reactions that, that you that you saw. Yeah, um, so that's like one of the things where, so in the film, like we know that the UFOs came in 93 and that it's 29 years later now when the movie's taking place but um uh so almost like near the end of the film we just have this kind of like uh, this morning uh at a park after a party where there's like garbage everywhere and there's this banner that says like oh you know it's a it was a, it's a party for like 20 year anniversary of north and south uh korea reunification it's like oh that's so that would be like i don't know like around 2020 years around that when this happened yeah. uh oh sorry uh 2020 uh, year 2000 when when it happened then i think is i put it in my phone because i was like yes right, 2002 because right, right. we're in 20 yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's kind of like um so like when it so in the world of the film probably obviously like when it happened it was probably like the hugest deal it's like the fall of the berlin wall it's like the end of an era like i'm sure there was like it was like all everyone talked about for like years and years but mm -hmm. that's years and years um it's 20 when it's 20 years it's kind of like no matter like when how huge of an event it is you don't talk about it in your everyday life like mm -hmm. in a uh, normal conversation right um you remember like once a year and then you celebrate it and um kind of th think about it then like even the like the fall of the berlin wall was huge but like germans don't talk about it today like every day it's like there's a memorial and once in a while you'll talk about it but it's not like something anyone's obsessed about anymore yeah. um so in that way i wanted to kind of show how like um also in the theme of like the mundaneness like everything even ufo the existence of ufos has become a mundane thing after 29 years even this huge political event also has become this mundane thing. And um, that's part of the thing um, I wanted to express. And that sequence is like a musical <laughs> sequence and they're singing a song and that uh, was a song by uh, my friend's band, Sagumachi, and it's called Mud Flat. And the lyrics are, he, he, he didn't write it for the film. It's a song he already had in his album that I said, can I use it? Um, and he said, okay. And the, originally the song, the lyrics are more, it's poetic uh, description of like child abuse. Um, mm -hmm. Like a, a, the singer, the lyrics are written from the point of a view of an adult who was abused as a child, thinking back on his childhood and the abuse and the, the parent who, Ad adult who gave that uh, abused him um and just kind of talking about the scars that are left and how it's hard to move on from the scars and all that and in the context of the film like with the north south korea 
of reunification and everybody's in cleaning uniforms that kind of are this army green kind of color and like the cleaning up the garbage from the party like the bottles and everything and I, I guess I'm kind of trying to make it a metaphor for um, uh, I guess moving on from the past like um, like this kind of a sins of our fathers kind of thing where the people who, like the young people we weren't born when these things happened um, but there are decisions that the older generations have made are influencing like global warming is one thing, but like the Korea, uh, the, the political situation, North and South Korea in North and South Korea is an even more complicated thing because Koreans were involved, but the main actors were actually the U S and the Soviets. So it's like, even not, it's like, because of decisions other people have made in other eras, it's affecting like, our lives and it's like trying to move on and envision a future and trying to dream of this future where things are run like that but then there's like always this um in korean there is an expression like like someone's holding you by your ankle <laughs> that's kind of like a good um, image for it i think it felt feels like you're being held back uh and you want to have you create something new like a new world with new rules that we want to come up with but then there's like this anchor <laughs> and yeah trying to move on and heal from the yeah yeah no it's i totally get it um because like that scene is like it's the younger generation always has to clean up the messes of the older generations you know <laughs> yeah kind and, of like and, and and i thought that's that's like the, the the song is talking about them because it talks about scars and healing and looking at scars and that you know scars don't ever really go away scars are permanent and mm -hmm. then as they're saying that, while they're cleaning and they're looking off like over like the horizon, looking across the lake and the Han River, there's this, I, I wanted, I needed to ask you, I'm like, was that completely intentional? Was that planned? Like there's an army oh. battalion that walks <laughs> across in the background. I'm like, are those actors or were you just filming on an army battalion just, just happened to be passing by? And if they were on routine, I'm like, I had to ask because I thought that was so metaphorical because it says uh -huh. so much that like, it says so much about like korea because korea is one of the few countries still that has mandatory enlistment so even mm -hmm. though they have the reunification and like as you said like korea became north and south korea because of the u.s it was two u.s soldiers under the mm -hmm. leadership of general mccarthy who stood mm -hmm. randomly some part in, in mm -hmm. korea and said oh the 30th parallel will be uh here randomly picked the mm -hmm. spot and divided an entire country mm -hmm randomly and like because mm. of that that's why you also have like the mandatory enlistment because of like the whole u.s military in presence and in, in, it's a whole thing people mm. research on it. but yes <laughs> but i wanted to ask you about the scene with the soldiers walking past because it says so much about where korea is physically mm. now in real time but then also even at that point in the film in terms of the filming that was kind of random and i don't know if we were even allowed to shoot <laughs> them in the background but they were just uh marching in the background and we were shooting there so i think they're out of focus but you can they're probably like looking what are they doing <laughs> and yeah, we're just yeah, yeah. kind of yeah <laughs> yeah they're so, walking back like what's yeah, going on there kinda, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah it was kind of random they just they're just oh let's shoot this let's shoot, do it now and they'll be in the background then <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah but i thought it was i just i thought the film was very heavily accidentally but very i think beautiful oh, yeah, yeah. Vocal, because it does achieve the the message of what you're talking about with the scars of the um of of the forefathers um so we're gonna get wrap, wrap up now but um i want you to talk i think the film ends very beautifully like this is also one of my i love this entire film because i love weird films <laughs> but i just love that it's so it's funny but it also makes you really really think about different things and one of the things about this film that it ends so very, I think, so beautifully and very unexpectedly is like one of the characters, he's just taking a trip across Asia. And like we are getting to see him visit places like, like um, the Taj Mahal and he's going to all these places and he meets like different people from these places. And one of them was a black woman. And I'm like, listen, when it comes to Korean cinema, we don't get to see many black people. Uh, okay? So when I saw yeah, a black woman, yeah. I was like, oh my God, he spoke to a black woman. <laughs> so, <laughs> so just talk to me about filming that and ending the film there. Cause I think it was a really beautiful way to end the film. And it kind of just made me, it was just one of those things where you get to see the world is so much bigger than we sometimes think, or we forget, we forget how big and beautiful the world is and how many different people we can see around the world. 
Yeah, so um, I guess throughout the movie, in between, we had these interview segments of people speaking in all different non-Korean languages, like uh, German, Chinese, like Polish and all that. And they're like talking head interviews, documentary style, and kind of like at the end, um, kind of like it's revealed that the guy on the motorcycle, uh, it was his voice also. If I don't know if you noticed um, when a docu, uh, the, um, the, the UFOs doesn't exist guy when he's oh, eating good. the ramen. Yeah. The, the, we never see the documentarian, but it's his voice, that character's mm -hmm. voice. <laughs> so, so kind of the whole uh, thing it's revealed at the end is he's the documentarian and he rides a bicycle, uh, motorcycle, and he's been interviewing these people in Korea. And now he's like, um, because North and Korea, <laughs> South Korea is uh, reunified. Right now, Korea is kind of like an island. If you want to travel, you have to take a plane everywhere, but it's a peninsula. So now that it's reunified, like he can just drive <laughs> from South Korea through North Korea to like China and like kind of basically all through Asia. And he ends up like in like Berlin. And um, so, yeah, so he kind of goes to like, you know, like Cambodia and all these places and meets all these people that he interviewed. And he's kind of a documentary filmmaker who's making a documentary about people who have alien identities. So, um, yeah, that's kind of the um, uh, the plot of it. But thematically, I think um, what he is talking about is his identity is he, he remembers in his dreams being a space pilot. So other all the other characters who have these alien dreams, they remember being on the planet that they mm -hmm. were on. But then he remembers being on the spaceship and he was like driving the spaceship. And for from his perspective, he believes that he's he did that for like thousands of tens of thousands of years uh, going from like star to star. And he talks mm -hmm. about like as a space pilot, like like he knows how far apart stars are like people who are living on planets are like, you know, oh, the stars, but then space travel in like this actual scale of space, like um, it for he's saying that even with their technology, it takes like years, like tens, decades, or like hundreds of years from one star to other, another star. And then even when you get to the other star, most of the planets are like in uninhabitable, there's no life. And so, uh, he, so they've been traveling for like that in his uh dream he, they've been traveling for like thousands and hundreds of thousands of years and they finally found this place uh where there's like clean air and like you know resources and they can finally live so they kind of that, that, that's what he believes so he's just kind of saying how i guess he, just kind of putting it in perspective of how small earth is in mm -hmm. the whole space perspective of things and i guess for like all these characters have like these worldviews and his character's worldview is kind of like my proxy he's the documentary filmmaker so he's kind of like me just as the director putting my views and i guess it's that you know like um carl sagan's um pale blue dot um mm. kind of quote like there's like this picture from like um voyager where it's looking back on earth from like near pluto i think and it's like earth is like just this tiny dot in this Oh, like sea of stars and it's like such a small dot and it's like Carl Sagan's quote is how like all of human history all of like the wars the triumphs like the the everything that happened all the races all the nations everything civilization happened on that tiny dot and like that's like this perspective of how small earth is in the big scheme of things and it's really just one it should be feel like just this one one home one planet but then it's so divided into um yeah. oh i'm a, i'm this nation i'm this race i'm this religion and it, people think it's we're all so different but <laughs> to an alien it's like it's such a tiny place where yeah along with the animals kind of in that montage i kind of have in the middle where it's like all these life forms on this tiny rock in space is sharing this home and that's kind of the perspective I wanted to end with. Mm. No, I that scene with the animals, I can, you it starts so oh happy, oh look cute baby animals, uh -huh. dolphins, whatever. And then it starts to hit you. Oh wait, this is also talking about the damage that we have, have, uh -huh. have as humans have done to the earth because there's like pollution in the water. You know, there's the bottles and all these things that you're just like, as you said, like we always say as humans, like all of our 
problems are minuscule in the grand scheme of things, but because this is the only home we know, like everything is blown out of proportion. And like, I personally believe we are not the only intelligent beings to exist anywhere in our universe or galaxy because the, the, it's too big. It's too expansive for us to just be the only beings. But as far as we know, we're the only ones that have like done wars, destruction, you know, like causing all these things like global warming, global catastrophes. And the film does talk a lot about putting things into perspective personally. And um, I think that's a beautiful, I think the way how you ended the film is a beautiful way for us to say, we love the home we have, you know, see it for what it is, like travel around the world. Like if people traveled more, they probably have a better appreciation mm. for the planet that we, that we live on. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> <Kinda>. <laughs> I <again>. agree. <laughs> <laughs> um, so but anyway, thank you so much for speaking with me, Jude. I really appreciate you taking the time. And I know like doing festivals, the festival circuit, it's not easy. It takes a lot of energy out of you. Yeah. So um, tell everyone what they're, what you're doing next and where they can find you and what you're up to. Oh yeah. So um, we're still yeah in kind of in the middle of the festival circuit. In two days, Wednesday, I go to um, North Carolina for Kukaloris. That's a film festival there. And then a week after that, I go to a Singapore International Film Festival. So uh, those are the two in November that I'm going to. And then we have some like more next year. So, mm. yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, so congratulations on the film. I hope I hope more people get to see this film. Um, like I saw The Time Agent on Dusk. So Dusk is a platform um, that, that yeah, houses yeah. like short um, sci-fi films. So that's how I was able to see it. Mm -hmm. So I hope like your film is uh, be able to be um, go on, be distributed on a platform where everyone can see. Because I think this film yeah. is one of those films where a lot of people will go in with one idea and then come up with another um, <laughs> idea at the end. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I loved having this conversation with you. <laughs>